Thank you so much, Steve. That was wonderful. Brought me back to my childhood. Welcome. Welcome to Brookmead Congregational Church here in Nashville, Tennessee. I am Pastor Amory, and along with Pastor uh, Beverly, who is here with us today, and our worship assistant, and Pastor Laura, who is preaching at uh, the Holy Trinity, Holy Trinity Congregational Church today, I'd like to welcome you to our service. Welcome to Brookmead. If you are male, female, LGBTQ, straight, old, and young, or a little bit of each. Have ancestors of one color or many colors, are rich, poor, doubting, believing, or somewhere in between. Are immigrant or citizen in recovery, recovered, both, or neither. neither have an able-bodied or disabled body, or some of both, are a member or a visitor because of who you are and where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. Please stand as you are able and join us in singing our welcome song, You Are Welcome Here. tongues to sing, hymnal number 42. spirits and teach us to follow you. Give us courage and strength to be your faithful disciples. Amen. O God, oh God wisdom, wisdom of, of the universe, universe you bear the pain of your, of your people. people. Grant, Grant us the gift, gift of wisdom that we may discern your way and live justly and graciously amid the struggles of this world.
Now is the time we have this wonderful opportunity to greet each other with peace and love. You may elbows tight, fist bump, namaste, whatever makes you comfortable. Please share the past. Want to uh, draw your attention to uh, a couple of announcements in our insert. One is that we do have a pride booth at the Pride Festival this year. This is delayed from the spring because of COVID. If you have time and want to represent our church and what we stand for, then please speak to Tony and see if he has any slots left for you. Uh, are there any other announcements that uh, are not in the bulletin or that need to be highlighted? I guess one is that we have our special congregational meeting coming up next week. And so you should have received, if you're an active member, a, um, a mailing with explanation, with all the facts that we have available at our disposal at this time, and um, the options that are being voted on for the church, and you can return your ballot in advance, just in case you can't make it that day, and still attend to see what is said here. All options are open for you in terms of how you participate, but we need everybody's vote who is an active member. Thank you for being dedicated members to our congregation. And I speak not only to those who are here today, but to those who watch us on YouTube every week or almost every week. We treasure you as well, and we need your votes for the future of this church. Um, I believe that Steve has prepared special music for us today. Is there anything you'd like to say about it, Steve? Uh, not really. <laughs> <laughs> okay. It's just kind of steady. Oh.
scripture this morning is from a part of our Bible our, that we don't usually hear from. It's from the Wisdom of Solomon, which is a book of the Bible, originally a separate set of scrolls, that was written during what we call in the Christian community, the, especially the Protestant community, the intertestamental period written after the Hebrew scriptures were closed and before Jesus came and the Christian scriptures began to be written. They were written when the Hellenism that had been spread throughout that part of the world by Alexander the Great was really very, very strong in that part of uh, in the entire Middle East, uh, Palestine, uh, Lebanon, throughout the area. And one of the characteristics of this Hellenistic thought was that it personified virtues such as wisdom. And it took that very seriously and used those as powerful, powerful ways to help people to understand how to live a better, more fulfilling life. And the Jews who were influenced by this general culture um, accepted that and adopted some of that personification that they found in the, uh, among the Greek writers. So this is from the Wisdom of Solomon, speaking of wisdom. For she is a reflection of eternal light, a spotless mirror of the working of God and an image of his goodness. Although she is but one, she can do all things. And while remaining in herself, she renews all things. In every generation, she passes into holy souls and makes them friends of God and prophets. For God loves nothing so much as the person who lives with this one. She is more beautiful than the sun and excels every constellation of the stars. Compared to the light, she is found to be superior, for it is succeeded by the night. But against wisdom, evil does not prevail. She reaches mightily from one end of the earth to the other, and she orders all things well. Our second scripture this morning is from the Christian scriptures from the Epistle of James, chapter 3. Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers and sisters, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. For all of us make many mistakes. Anyone who makes no mistakes in speaking is perfect, able to keep the whole body in check with the bridle. If we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we guide their whole bodies. Or look at ships, though they are so large that it takes strong winds to drive them, yet they are guided by a very small rudder, wherever the will of the pilot directs. So although the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great exploits. How great a forest is set ablaze by a small fire, and the tongue is a fire. The tongue is placed among our members as a world of inequity. It stains the whole body, sets on fire the cycle of nature, and is itself set on fire by hell. For every species of beast and bird, of reptile and sea creature, can be tamed and has been tamed by the human species. But no one can tame the tongue. A restless evil, full of deadly poison. With it we bless the Lord and Father, and with it we curse those who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers and sisters, that ought not to be so. Does a spring pour forth from the same opening both fresh and brackish water? Can a fig tree, my brothers and sisters, yield olives or grapevine figs? 
No more can salt water yield flesh. Thanks be to God. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Thanks be to God. Can you join me in prayer? God bless the meditations of my heart and the hearing of these words. Amen. It's really nice to have a worship assistant that can explain the song of Solomon <laughs> to. <laughs> I really appreciated that, Beverly, today. Um, so many of you know that I have four children. Um, so there's a lot of them and they require a lot of attention. So about 10 years ago, my son, who's going to be 25 on Tuesday, um, had a project to do from school. And we lived in Connecticut, which is a little older here than here in Tennessee. And we had to do a gravestone rubbing. And we luckily had this um, cemetery that's about a mile from the house and it was old, probably the first person in there was 1680 or so, and beautiful hydrangea bushes all around it. So we came upon this gravestone and the elements had almost erased the inscription, but one can barely make out the epitaph and it said, beneath this stone, a lump of clay lies Mistress Joan, Jones, who on the 24th of May began to hold her tongue. <laughs> during, this, during this period, many tombstones bore statements of truth. Obviously, Mistress Jones had difficulty taming her tongue. You know, the Bible makes control of the tongue as a matter of very great importance. Jesus said, for by your words you will be acquitted, and by the, your words you will be condemned. The books of Proverbs and Psalms are full of exhortations on the tongue. Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and he who guards his mouth and his tongue keeps, keeps himself from calamity. Yet, there are many positive impact statements about the tongue. The tongue of the righteous is choice silver, or the tongue of the wise brings healing. James gave more, more attention to the dangers of tongue than any other New Testament writer. In every single chapter, he mentions it. And in chapter three, he gives it his fullest attention, giving metaphors of the bridle to the horse, the rudder to the ship, and the match to the forest fire. It's, it is stated that there is nothing is open more by mistake than the mouth. Here in this section is a vivid description of the problems and the power of the tongue. Jesus, James warns us, don't let your tongue be your undoing. I'm gonna let you in on a little secret here. Learning to hold my tongue has been the greatest challenge of my life. And here it's where it gets complicated because as a woman in this world, we are often unseen and unheard and as a, an aside, as I have aged, this has only gotten worse. And I can only imagine what this must like be for my sisters of color. Often as women, our thoughts and opinions are ignored, but today I'm talking about something a little different. It's learning to hold our tongue in the relationship to the people we love, the people we serve, and the people we are in community with. So I grew up with an example of a cutting tongue from my mom and dad. Like a lot of us, they fought a lot. And although there was not hardly any physical violence in our home, the violence was in the speech. They used it against each other and eventually against me. And eventually as a teenager, I used it against them. So when I began my first adult relationships and when I was angry, I could cut down those I love with words that hurt. After all, that was what I was inadvertently trained to do. But as an adult, it's my responsibility to make amends about that with those damages. So hold that thought for a minute. In my work as a minister, learning to use speech wisely was so helpful in my professional 
in personal life. So one way to be one way people become chaplains is to be in a program called uh, past, uh, oh my gosh, clinical pastoral education. Sorry, my brain for you froze for a minute. So clinical pastoral education is how we pe train people to be chaplains. Every major denomination usually requires someone to, a, a minister to do a uh, one credit of CPE. Beverly was a CPE supervisor, so she was basically in charge of all these people training to be chaplains. Um, it was the most profound experience of my life. I did six, uh, six units, I did an internship, a residency, and then I trained to do the same job Beverly did until I decided that wasn't for me. Um, and I remember like being so nervous when I went in to see my first patients because I was like, oh my God, what do I say? What do I say? What do I say? And you know, when you're nervous, like you all of a sudden all these words come out and sometimes we don't know what to say. So we fill it with empty words. I learned that when people are struggling and suffering and hospitalized or dying, they don't need anything but people to listen. And learning to listen and shut my mouth and just be present for people in their hour of need was such a profound learning experience. And I had this wisdom that I realized that sometimes shutting up is the best thing you can do for somebody and just give them the power of your presence that says, I'm gonna be here with you while you go through this. The wisdom that I gained from being quiet was so, so much better than the nervous platitudes I could give. So as a professional caregiver, it was easier to maintain these boundaries of being quiet and guarding my tongue, because that's what I was trained to do. I know many of us understand that from our work experiences, especially those of us who are in the caregiving or the teaching fields. But with the people I love, it's a little harder. Why? because we have baggage between us. And what I'm talking about is the pain and the hurt and the anger and the disappointment that exists in many of our relationships. Is there a person in our lives that might benefit from us holding our tongue? Is there a person that we saw show sometimes our worst selves to and how can we do better? First of all, we need to admit sometimes that we say too much. We also have to admit that we are wrong. But most of all, we have to offer the words of assurance to those we love, of forgiveness and gratitude and love. I am sorry, I love you. I am so happy you are in my life. And that is the amazing thing about speech, is it can maim, but it also can heal. And remember the proverb said, the tongue of the wise brings healing. Right speech can do so much good in this world. And I know we've all witnessed angry and evil speech in the last years in our country. And we have witnessed the damage it has done. As we think past our personal relationships though, where else can we tame our tongue in our lives? Is it work? Is it an organization we belong to or maybe our church? Where do we need to speak up from a place of love and kindness? And where do we need to be quiet and listen? One thing I appreciate about being older is the wisdom of a lifetime of making a lot of mistakes. And I always wanna do better as a person. And also I wanna live a happier life. In our first reading today, we heard about wisdom. In the Old Testament, wisdom is referred to as, as Sophia. It is the most fully female, developed female character for God in the wisdom literature of ancient Israel. In these, the wisdom of God 
is often personified as a woman. Scholars now commonly refer to, refer to this personification as Sophia, the Greek word for wisdom. And I love this image. And the Song of Solomon goes on to talk about a spirit that is intelligent, holy, unique, manifold, subtle, mobile, clear, unpolluted, distinct, invulnerable, loving the good, keen, irresistible, beneficent, humane, steadfast, sure, free from anxiety, all-powerful, overseeing all, and penetrating through all. This also reminds me of the opening verses, uh, verse of the Quran, in which they talk about the attributes of God. And all of these are attributes of God. And Sophia is often seen as the Holy Spirit. So I had the opportunity to watch my youngest son this week have the opportunity to learn wisdom. He is 18. He is away at college. I dropped him off the beginning of August. He has been having a marvelous time. Really, he's doing well. He's an extrovert, makes friends easy, tall, 6'2", handsome. He's got life in the palm of his hand. He got sick on Wednesday. Called me up, said my roommate's sick. I think I'm getting sick. We had a lot of COVID worries. Um, his dad had um, uh, cancer about 10 years ago, and so we, he's low platelets. And so when Cole was home with his father, there was a lot of worry about COVID. Eventually his dad did get COVID, he's fine. Um, so Cole has a lot of anxiety around COVID. So he called me up, I don't feel good. And I'm like, okay, well, you know, go, go to the health center, go get tested. And this is the first time in his life he's ever had to navigate being sick and being alone. And he had a really hard time for a little while, I'll have to admit. Um, he called me, so he we went to the health center, didn't have COVID, and proceeded to get sicker and sicker and sicker. On Friday, he called me and he was a mess. He was crying, I wanna come home, I miss everybody, I need to be home. And I'm like, Cole, you know, we, we can't do that right now. And you're just gonna have to, um, you know, take the fluids. I sent him a care package. So take the fluids, eat the crackers, do everything you need. He had also a really upset stomach. So, so he calls me on Friday night and he wants to leave his room. And so he ended up, I ended up getting him a hotel room so he could have some privacy to be sick. And he gets to the hotel room and he starts again, calls me up. And I'm like, honey, I, I can't do anything, but I can be on Zoom with you all night long. <laughs> so I put him on Zoom and he fell asleep on Zoom. And eventually we turned off Zoom and I had the phone so that he had another person there. So he just needed somebody there with him. So we did that. The next day he had a very rough night. Next morning he was very sick in the morning. I said, honey, you got to go to the hospital. Just, just go. The health center was closed on the weekend go to the hospital. And I'm starting to make a point. I'm thinking about calling Beverly and saying, you know, I can't preach to know, I gotta go to Colorado. I've, I've gotta go. And, um, but I also knew as a mama that I needed to like let him navigate this on his own because he needed the wisdom of how to navigate being sick for the first time. And although my instincts were to rush there and run every, put everything down and rush there, I just knew that wasn't the best for him. But I also knew I had responsibilities this week that I had to attend to. So then he calls me up from the emergency. Mom, this is the stupidest thing. I'm 18 years old. I don't need to be at the emergency room. This is just so dumb, so dumb. I should not be here, blah, 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 blah. The doctor comes back, he had had a chest x-ray. He has pneumonia, bacterial pneumonia. Mm -hmm. And I was so glad to be on the phone because I was like, see, I told you so. <laughs> you needed to go to the hospital. <laughs> Great learning for him, right? You know, he's 18 years old. He's really sick. He had to get himself to the hospital. He also had to navigate with no car, getting back and forth and, you know, call. and so he's called me up. Um, he's had two courses of antibiotics and I haven't heard from him since five o'clock last night. So I'm gonna assume he's doing well. But he learned so much in those last 
couple of days. He learned to take care of himself. He learned that he, he learned that he's capable of navigating this stuff. He didn't know how to do some things. I had to talk him through it. But he was able to do all those things and me rushing in and taking care of him would not have helped. And I would have really resented it if I had flown there, given up this, and he was better by <laughs> Saturday night for getting better. Wisdom that I know as a mom of four kids, he's the baby, and wisdom that this young man is starting to learn. My question is, will he absorb this wisdom? Sometimes we have to do things several times before it hits us, and it will it become life wisdom for him. I don't know. Could this be how the Holy Spirit, Sophia, is working in our lives? I think this is a great question for us to ponder. Where have we seen the Holy Spirit work in our lives? And where have we seen the Holy Spirit work in our church? How can we use right, loving, and thoughtful speech to tend the needs of ourselves, our lives, our church, our community, and our world? Amen. Can you join me in singing and rise in body or spirit? God, speak to me that I may speak. It is in our hymnal 531. Would you join me in prayer? Holy One Creator, Mother and Father of us all, we come to you for some celebrations, some joys, and some current concerns. We pray for those who have lost loved ones this week, Kevin and Robbie, Kevin's father passed away, and Adora and her aunt, who is the last matriarch of a generation. We pray for those families as they process the, the, they process the love, the loss of someone that they deeply love. And we also ask the Holy Spirit to be with them in their grief and sadness. We pray for Sydney and her father who is sick with cancer. We ask that we pray for all those who are dealing with health issues and navigating health issues in a time of a pandemic, which is so incredibly challenging. We ask that you be with 
the people that take care of them and all the doctors and the nurses and everyone that is attending to them. We ask that they have wisdom and they provide them the best knowledge and the best care that they can. We ask for love and guidance and just to wrap all those like Paula who struggle with homelessness that they may find a place to live, may waiting list open up and that they find a home. But even when they are not able to do that, that they may find loving people and people that will show them care and do the best to support them during the, their time of being without a home, which is so very, very hard. We pray for Angela and Wendy, who are still dealing with so many struggles. And we ask that you be a presence in their lives. We thank you for joy for the UCC. It is a wonderful denomination and I am so glad that I found it. And I know so many of us here today are glad that we found it. It is a beacon of progressive Christianity in this world. And we are so grateful that your spirit works through us and among us, and that we will always remember that God is still speaking, that you are still speaking. I ask you to be with all the caretakers of the world now, the caretakers that work in the hospitals and the caretakers particularly today that are at home they are taking care of loved ones and it can sometimes be very hard we ask that you help that they feel your presence especially when it gets tired and arduous and we help we ask for respite so that they may feed their souls a little bit I would like to end this prayer with the prayer of uh, Niebauer, who it is said in the AA rooms and the Al-Anon rooms, and it is, God, grant us the serenity to accept the things we cannot change, the courage to change the things we can, and the wisdom to know the difference. And another prayer that is said in these rooms is the Lord's Prayer. It is the prayer of our Savior that is printed in the bulletin. Will you join me now? Our Creator, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, and deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Jesus said, too much is given, much is expected. May the ushers come forward for our time of collection. Of our life, the shield of our help, 
from, from generation, generation to generation, may we thank, thank you and count your praises, evening, morning, morning and noon, for our lives, which, which are committed into your hand, for our, for our souls, which, which are entrusted to you, for your, for your miracles, miracles, which are with us every day, for, for your wonders and goodness of all times. times. O oh, oh, good one, your, your passion does not fail. O oh, merciful one, your, your loving kindness never ceases. Forever we hope in you. And we bless these gifts that they may go out to the world to do what is good. Amen. 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 Please join me in the sending hymn, Every Time I Feel the Spirit, 282 in our hymn. surpasses all understanding be with each and every one of us as we go out into this world to love and serve. And join me in the response. May, May the, the gentleness of God supportive and sustaining love gather us in her arms, arms today, today and bless us, us with peace, knowledge, and wisdom that restores both body and soul. Amen. Amen.